All right. I, I think we can start. So welcome to the first ISR Distinguished Speaker Series talk of the year. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Sue DeMay. Sue is a distinguished scientist at Microsoft Research. I just saw her a, a few weeks ago. Uh, she is also Deputy Managing Director of the Microsoft Research Lab in Redmond. She's an affiliate professor at the University of Washington Information School. Uh, Sue got her bachelor's degree from Bates College, which is in Maine. She got her PhD from Indiana University in psychology. Uh, Sue came to Microsoft in 1997, and before that, she was a researcher at Belcor. How many of you remember Belcor? Anyone? Okay, good. Uh, now, at that time, she worked on what was called the vocabulary problem. How many of you know what the vocabulary problem is? <laughs> it's basically the, the, the idea, uh, the, the simplest idea is that people use different vocabulary for when searching for information. And later with colleagues, Sue worked on the latent semantic indexing uh, idea. Uh, her paper on that is cited over 11,000 times. She's the author of over 200 articles, and in 2006, she became a fellow of the ACM. In 2009, she received the Gerald Salton Award. Uh, this is an Information Retrieval Lifetime Achievement Award. In 2011, she was inducted into the National Academy of Engineering. 2014, Sue received a very prestigious award, the Athena Lecture Award, for her fundamental contributions to computer science. Uh, she also received that year the Tony Strix Award, and in 2015, a, a great honor, she was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, fun fact about Sue, uh, she was born in Maine, which is very cold in the winter, for those of you who are unfamiliar with snow. And she likes obscure winter sports, so she likes uh, luge, ice hockey, and curling. So, Sue Dumais. Thanks, Lori. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to be here. So today what I'm going to talk about is work that I've done with a, a large number of colleagues in the area of improving web search. I'll talk mostly about personalization, but more broadly, by trying to understand the context <coughs> in which people's information needs arise. And I'll, talk, I'll highlight both the opportunities as well as talk about some of the challenges. So the, uh, I'll talk a little bit, first of all, about how um, context is important in information retrieval, where personalization fits into that. We've used a framework called the potential for personalization to understand how much uh, a query can benefit from personalization. And then I'll give several examples of systems that we've developed that span uh, the, a number of dimensions, most notably how we represent people's interests, over what time period, and then how they're used to improve systems. And at the end, I'll, I'll finish with some new challenges and, and directions. But before I start, what I'd like to do is take a step back 20 years and think about what the internet and web search looked like then. I just want to give you an idea of how rapidly uh, things are cha have changed in the last uh, two decades. And I think they're on a, a, an even greater pace for, for change moving forward. So uh, 20 years ago, the first graphical browser, NCSA Mosaic, was uh, about three years old. Uh, early web search engines were starting to appear. They were a year or two old. You've probably never heard of any of them. Uh, you've heard of some of these, right? Uh, web Crawler, Jumpstart, uh, InfoSeq, AltaVista, Lycos, and I've, sh I've shown a, a couple of them here. You can see the NCSA Mosaic's start page and then some of the early search engines. What's interesting is this one has both a directory as well as a, a search box. Uh, the NSF had just started their program on digital libraries, and two students at Google had built a system called Backrub. Um, taking a somewhat more personal look back at online presence, 
Here's what the uh, Information and Computer Science Department homepage looked like here in 1997. Huh, where did I get that? Into Wayback Machine. It's really fabulous. Um, there's, this actually isn't bad. There's a nice picture. The New Times Roman font is a little dated. Uh, and then there's this quirky thing here that says server access statistics. So you can get you know, the, the web logs, I mean the, the web access statistics. That's not bad. Um, this is the Irvine Research Unit in Software, which I think became, did it become the um, IS, ISR? Yes. Yeah. Um, so this is a little more interesting. It has an interesting <laughs> graphic. Uh, no fancy multimedia here. And again, in, in New Times Roman. Uh, ISR actually did exist in the Irvine domain. Uh, does anybody remember what it was? It was um, Inform's journal. It was an information. This, information systems research. Okay, so the, the domain was used, and I think got co opted by this group uh, a little bit later. So I want to pick on uh, UC Irvine. This is what the Microsoft Research web page looked like. Um, that this is this, I just don't know how somebody got away with putting that there. It's this really crazy picture of technology and things imploding. Uh, there is a search button up here, but you know, again, it, this one is quirky at, at best. It's not sort of what the research page looks like today. The size of the web at that time was uh, under 3,000 domains. This was in, I think, 94. The Lycos Fuzzy Malden system from CMU debuted in uh, 94 with an index of 54,000 web pages. Okay? And that he didn't index the full text because it was unclear what the usage uh, <laughs> properties of that were. He indexed, I think, the first, I don't know, 128 bytes of the, the documents. Okay? And on this page, there's a little link here that says, look at the top 5% of sites. So I think this was the top 5% of new sites for the day. So to think that you could browse the internet by going to a start page like this and looking at 5% of the sites is um, nothing short of mind-boggling. The behavioral logs, he got about 1,000, 1,500 queries a day. Now you get that in you know, a few milliseconds on any of the major web search engines. Uh, I, I mentioned this at, at lunch today. The reason for this is at the time, a lot of systems had client-side search and client-side storage of, of uh, information. So I remember when I started at, at Microsoft, I, the folks from the Office help team came to my office and said, you need to help us improve Office search. I said, great, great, what are the problems? We don't know, we just know that it's not very good. Uh, what are the popular queries? We don't know. Uh, how did people reformulate? We don't know. And it's not that they were stupid or perverse, it's that all the information lived on an individual PC. All the help documentation was on here. You did all your searches, everything stayed here. There was the biggest improvement in Office search came from understanding queries that people posed that they had no idea people wanted to find and generating the content for that. So it was a very, very different world. One of the big things that enables a lot of systems now to iterate quickly is the ability to get things out, see how people interact with them, and improve based on that interaction. And that just wasn't there at all, even for, for major players. Today, in contrast, there are billions of websites, um, a trillion pages or so indexed by the major search engines, billions of searches and clicks every day. So in, in many ways, search has gone from being a, a, an arcane skill that you might have to go to graduate library school to understand or something that the computer geeks maybe in this room understood, to so something that's really a core fabric of everybody's lives. How many people have searched today? No. Okay. <laughs> you know, I have grandchildren. They search. They search the web. They search YouTube to find out how to do their latest rainbow loom things. Everybody expects it. You search to find information, to plan trips, to understand new medical conditions, to, to do a whole host of things that are either somewhat frivolous are really important, the sort of life and, and death kinds of things. It, search also goes above and beyond the web. It's in all our apps. It's on the desktop and, and so on. So I think it's more important now than ever to really understand what people are seeking when they search, to try to support that, um, and to really understand the context in which searches arise. And so that's what the, the rest of the talk is going to be like. 
So many people, when they think of search, think of a, a little rectangle at the top of a page and 10 blue links. I, because I studied information retrieval for many years as well as HCI, like to worry about how the query comes to meet the documents. As Gloria said, we worried a lot about the mismatch between how people articulate an information need and how authors of a document write it. A lot of that is actually in, mitigated on the web for some reasons. Um, but there's a lot more that goes on behind the scenes in making search engines like this work. And that's what I think is really important to understand, especially for folks here with interdisciplinary perspectives on information access. So the first of them is understanding who's asking. Now, queries don't fall from the sky. They come from real live human beings trying to solve a problem, trying to, to learn something. Uh, there's a lot of information about that that can be used to help improve retrieval. Um, documents are not just a bunch of unordered web pages. I mean, it, so let me take a step back. It, in many ways, it's nothing short of astounding that you can take a trillion web pages with no curation, type in on average two and a half words, and get anything that's at all relevant. It's really astounding on many levels. But there is a lot of structure that's used, both in understanding where the queries are coming from, and also documents are really richly interconnected. They might be on the same domain, they might share hyperlinks, they might have been co-accessed in the same sessions. Really understanding and leveraging that's really important to providing great services. And perhaps the most important thing is in the lower left here, it's really understanding why people are searching. Um, you know, I've done search for and a variety of other things for the better part of uh, 35 years. I love it. I'm fascinated by the problems. But even I don't get up in the morning and say, hey, 15 minutes to kill. I think I'll search. I do it. No, and we don't. We do it because we want to do something. And understanding the broader task context in which these information needs arise, I think, um, will it really helps understanding the, the query. And that's part of the reason I'm interested in, in personalization and contextualization. So queries in isolation, if you really did drop queries from the sky, are incredibly hard to understand. Uh, the query up there is S-I-G-I-R. Anybody got any ideas what that means? Sure. <laughs> well, we're going to do another one of these in a minute. But the, yeah, the, I think it's much easier to interpret this if you understand a little bit about who's asking what they've done in the past, where they are, when it is. And let me illustrate some of those. So you, you all got this. If I ask about um, SIGIR, what I want is the Information Retrieval Conference. I want an award from them. I should at least go to the conference. That's probably very interesting to me. Uh, and so here's the upcoming page. So that's what a uh, page for the upcoming SIGIR conference. It's interesting that one of them just happened a few months ago, but I'm probably less interested in that now than I was two months ago. There's this guy here, Stuart. Stuart Bowen Jr. Anybody know Stuart? He's, you can tell from the red tie and the suit that he's probably not an IR guy. Um, <laughs> Stuart is the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction, also abbreviated SIGIR, and they have a very fancy page. Okay. Um, you can also interpret this query by knowing perhaps what the previous query was. If it was about information retrieval, it's one meaning of the word. If it's uh, US Coalitional Provisional Authority, it might be another. You might get hints about it based on the location. If I'm searching at a CIR conference, that's one thing versus Washington, DC, where the Special Inspector General lives, it's another. Um, even, so imagine now that we know I'm interested in CIR, the conference or the organization. In January, what I want to know about is submission deadlines, because that's when the submission deadline is. In July or August, what I want to know about is the conference in logistics. So even given that we focused on the right topic, what I want is dependent on, on the time frame. The, the main point uh, in this slide, and, and really in many ways in, in the talk, is that if you use a single ranking for everyone, at every point in time, in every context, you're going to fundamentally limit how well the search engine can do. There are different, we have a very heterogeneous and broad set of customers as web search engines, and one size does not fit all. It doesn't in clothing and it doesn't in, in search engines. So th the framework we use uh, to understand the potential for improving search is what we call the potential for personalization. 
And what we try to do is quantify the variation in what it is that people want given the same query okay. across different individuals. So this graph uh, on the x-axis has the number of people I'm trying to serve. This is a very small search engine with six people that I'm trying to serve. And the y-axis is a DCG, which is discounted cumulative gain. It's a measure of the quality of the search engine. And this is performance. We have DCG of one if everybody had their own perfect search engine. Okay, That's what you get. Now, as I add more people to the system that I'm trying to serve with a single ranking, I'm going to, by definition, decrease how well I can do for any one of them. Right? So as I add more and more people, I'm not going to serve each one as well. And the gap between those two, between how well I can do for an individual and how well I can do for everybody, is what we call the potential for personalization. So a lot of what we want to do is understand how big that gap is and then to, to try to improve it. Um, there are lots of ways to measure the, relevant, the relevance to an individual. There are two main classes of, of ways. One is you can explicitly ask people whether something you showed them is relevant or not. That's the best ground truth that you can get. Uh, it's really tedious for people uh, as well. It's, it's, it's more than tedious. It's really annoying to be asked constantly. Um, there are also implicit measures. So you can look at things like which results people click on. Do they click on any results? Do they reformulate? And so you can use signals of both types to understand how different people uh, interact with search results and which different results they click on. We, this is just the results from uh, one study that, that we did where we actually did ask people to explicitly make judgments. Uh, and what we found in the study was that you could improve the search quality um, by about 46% if you improve the search engine itself. So if you improve just the core ranking, tweaking all those, those parameters, you could do a good job of it. You can improve it by 70% if you include personalization. That is, understanding what different people mean by the same query, or the same person means by the same query in different contexts. Okay, so there's a huge potential to improve search engines. Um, not all queries have a high potential for personalization. Take a query like Facebook. If you type that, what would you expect to get back? Facebook.com? Maybe the stock symbol, but almost everybody who types that query clicks on the same link. SIGIR, in contrast, has at least two different meanings. It actually has dozens. There's something called SIGIR burgers. I, I, uh, there's all sorts of things. Uh, here's a, uh, these are actual queries um, that end with maps. So on the top is Bing Maps and Google Map. Those have very low potential for personalization. Almost everybody clicks on the same thing when they do it. It's essentially a navigational queries. Others like street maps or Europe maps, people go to lots of different uh, information. And so those have much higher potential for personalization. And one of the things we can do is learn when you should personalize and, and when you should. Okay. Um, let's take the query UCI. What's its potential for personalization? Is it near the high end or near the lower end? High end, okay. So you might mean this. Right. 37 million pages have this in it. Only about less than 10% of those also have UC Irvine in it. So that's a hint that there might be other things. There's this lovely organization called the Union Cycliste Internationale. That's a bike racing organization. They have lovely uh, road races, lots of information. This is one, um, this is uh, OpenWRT, which is a, a Linux branch, I think, that is uh, for embedded devices. And this is a, the unified configuration interface for it. These are all on the top 10 results. Uh, there's UCI Unlimited, which is a container company. Okay, so there's a fair And all of these, again, are reasonably popular. UCI dominates. And certainly, if I'm here in this room, it's probably important. So let's imagine that we've got UC uh, Irvine. What do people really want when they're looking for it? They might want the home page. I found out a lot about Peter. Peter the Anteater, is that, yeah. Um, welcome back. You might want facts from Wikipedia. It's actually really hard to find facts about a, a company or a person in their home pages. You might care um, a lot about the Twitter feed, and what's <coughs> happening in the world. You might care about breaking news. This is the uh, eSports arena. Or you might care about this department. I think it actually shows up in the top 10 or 15 for, for the query UCI. 
as does the UCI machine learning data set and, and a few others. So the, the first kind of, of uh, ambiguity had to do with the meaning of the, the term UCI. And that's kind of an extrinsic notion of diversity. This is, we all agree that it has to do with UC Irvine, but what part of it do I want to know about? And that's more of a, a notion of uh, intrinsic diversity. So how could you start telling these different interests apart? Question? How, how much you know these? How much you know whether I mean uh, the bicycling stuff or the university or the embedded devices software or the container company? Recent searches. Recent searches, okay. Location. Location. Others? Okay, so <laughs> there are lots of things you might. So one, and you've mentioned one of each. That's a very good tag team there. Um, one of them is you might know contextual, as, as it has been for many years. <laughs> um, you can use contextual metadata, where it is, when it is, what device I'm on. You might want, people want different things typically on a phone or mobile device and on a desktop. And you can certainly use past behavior, both behaviors in this current search session as well as longer term interests and, and preferences. And so what I'm going to talk about now is how we use all of those signals to improve search. The, the most important part of personalization is representing a person's interests and activities. This is a really dense slide, and I'm not going to go through it in, in a lot of detail. But to construct a model, we use lots of sources of evidence. We use the content, which queries, which documents you've looked at. We use behavior, sometimes very specific things about the web pages you visited, uh, both implicit and explicit feedback. We use all sorts of contextual data. You might aggregate that at different time frames, things that have happened in the immediate past or longer term preferences. And then I talk about personalization, but it, it really is uh, broader than that. You can look at groups of people who are similar along many dimensions. Uh, and then there are a whole host of choices in how you use those models, whether it resides on the client or the server, uh, whether it's used in ranking or presentation and, and so on. And so the, I'm going to talk about three projects that vary uh, in this space. So the first of them is something called personal navigation, which uses a very simple model, just queries and visited web pages of individuals, um, and it influences ranking. Another one is called Personalized Search, which is one of the first projects I did in this area that captures a lot of information, but it lives only on the client. And then the last is something that, that uh, does a combination of different sources of evidence and, most importantly, different time frames. This is one that looks at recent uh, sort of task-based interests. So personal navigation um, is work uh, led by Jamie Tiban and, and others. The, we think of search really as a way to discover new information. But it turns out that refinding is really common in the web. This was one of the big differences in web search compared to library search. People often search for the same thing. If you look uh, at the percent of queries that are repeat queries, 33% of the queries you issued to a search engine you've issued before. Okay. If you look at the pages you visit, 39% of the pages you visit in search results you visited before. Okay, and a large proportion of these are what are called navigational queries. That is, they're queries not really to find out information, but to get to a particular location. So you type in Facebook, you want to go to Facebook.com. You type in New York Times, you want to go to NewYorkTimes.com. The interesting thing about these is that they're very consistent across individuals, and so it's easy for a search engine or any system to, to deal with. And they tend to be identified by low click entropy, that is, low variation in what people <coughs> click, as well as common anchor text. So almost everyone that points to, we'll say, Microsoft's homepage has the word Microsoft homepage in it. And that, that uh, commonality in how people refer to the page is really important. But the insight in this work was that, sure, these are fine. Anybody with half a brain who runs a big web search engine is going to nail these kinds of queries. You absolutely need to. But what they discovered is that there are also a class of queries called personal navigational queries. These are, have very consistent behavior within an individual, but different behaviors across individuals. So it's like me and Stuart. I always go to the SIG IR, ACM SIG IR site. He always goes to the Special Inspector General site. We're both behaving navigationally, but there's a different intent. This happens not just for navigational sites, but Different people have different preferences for what weather site to visit. I always go to weather.gov. Somebody else might go to um, AccuWeather, to weather.com, and, and so on, or your local TV station. 
the behavior within an individual is very consistent and across individuals it's not. So, all right, so I just said that. So I might want the, you know, the SIGIR page, Stuart wants the other page. Um, and so this is a case where personalization can really help. You can uh, do things like highlight what I want, move it up in the rankings, and so on. So we did, um, the way that we studied this was to use, first of all, large-scale log analysis of previous interaction histories to identify the fact that these kinds of queries existed. I think it was really um, quite unknown. And what we used here was the consistency of clicks within an individual as an indication uh, that they wanted to go back to, to that page. Somebody asked, it, I think, at uh, lunch whether you know, Bing was uh, six lines of code or many more. This, this program is about 12 lines of code. The, we, very specifically, if you issue a query and click on one and only one page, you issue that query again at another point in time and click on the same page, same one and only one page, you're 95% likely to do so a third time if you issue that query. Okay, so that's a pretty simple algorithm, and I store a little data on that. So the, in looking at the logs, you could identify that 12% of the queries were like this. That's a huge volume of queries that um, are hard to accommodate with a single ranking strategy, and the accuracy is incredibly high. This is a very, very low risk optimist, uh, low risk personalization. It's one that could be done with infrastructure that was already in, in place when we did it. So it was a, a very easy way to, to see how, how well it worked. These are all what I call offline evaluations. They're done with logs without an operational uh, system. The true test of any of these <coughs> things is you run it live in real time. Because a lot of things that work offline don't necessarily work when you try them with real people. In, a, in this case, uh, an online evaluation, which we often called AB <coughs> tests or bucket tests, um, confirmed that this was actually a, a very, very good thing. Okay. The, the second example I want to talk about is something called P-Search. Um, here, what we used was a very rich model of people's interests. So we used the full desktop search index, documents you had on your hard drive, web pages you visited. Um, What's interesting about this is it provides a very rich and evolving model of what you're interested in, both in kind of acute information needs as well as longer term needs. And what we did here was send only the query to the server and did all the re-ranking on the client. Okay. And so the way it worked is I would type in a uh, you know, query like UCI, send it off to Bing, the results would come back. We had your um, local model. We'd match it to each of the results to figure out which ones were likely relevant to you. And then we re-rank the results. Okay, so this happens all on the client. This has um, some lovely properties. It has great privacy. It is limited, however, in its portability. So it works on this machine, but not my phone, not on another machine. It's actually pretty inefficient, because in order to get good results, we need to return a lot more than 10 items and re-rank them locally. Uh, it's not all that accurate, because if the I think we returned 100 results, but if that 100 didn't have good fodder for personalization, you're sort of, uh, you're no better off than you are now. And it doesn't use any of the interaction trails of, of others, many of whom are quite similar to me. Um, we studied this. The, the details of this model are that the, the way we did this was we took the global match, the one that's used for everybody, and then a personal score that indicated how much I am likely to, to like each of the search results. Uh, that personal score was based both on content match, so my general interests represented in several different ways, as well as interaction features. What, you know, what queries did I issue and what URLs did I click on? Again, that's all state, saved client side. Uh, the evaluation, we did two evaluations, as we do in a lot of these. Uh, we did an offline evaluation using explicit judgments, so we gave people a bunch of results that were the union of these two different methods of finding things. Uh, had them judge which were relevant, and then use that to fine tune our, our system. Um, you don't want to let any system loose unless you're pretty sure that it will work and will work robustly. And so we do a lot of this kind of offline testing, whether it's through logs or through explicit judgments. Um, and then we did an online evaluation. In this case, we used a small prototype that we had built. Uh, we had a few hundred people um, who we who download a, downloaded a browser plugin. And the way we showed the results here was in a kind of bifurcated list. These were the usual web results. 
And above that, we put zero, one, or two results that we thought might be of interest to you. Okay. And what we found was that the there were 28% more clicks for the personalized results. Um, and personalized results were relevant for, I think, about 74% of the queries. So a fair amount of the queries are things that we had some good indication that you were interested in. The, you can have more or less evidence about how interested I am in something. And so if we looked at cases where the evidence for personalization was strong, we got about 74% higher click-through. So the, the system was really um, quite effective. And again, we learned models based on, on this distinction for when we should personalize and how much evidence we needed to, to do it. Okay, the, the next, so the first two items, uh, I've the two examples I've talked about had long-term models that kind of aggregated over all my searches. Uh, in this, and this work also has long-term um, signals of preferences and interests. But we also were very interested in the short-term context. What is it that you've been doing right now? It turns out that 60% uh, of search, search sessions have multiple queries. So people are not coming in, doing a single query, and, and leaving. Many, many of the search sessions have uh, a large number of queries, and so you can get some evidence about what I'm, I'm doing. And um, yeah, a, a large proportion of time that people spend in search, I think it's something like 40 or 50 percent of the time that people spend in search are spent in sessions that last more than 30 minutes. So people doing serious uh, discovery for you know, medical issues, uh, technical issues, and, and the like. And these provide tremendous opportunity to improve results based on what you've been doing. So the, the idea here, and I think Gary alluded to it when he said you should use previous uh, queries, or, or is if I issue the query SIG IR, and I've either issued before that information retrieval or a rack reconstruction, you can get a pretty good s signal for what I might be interested in. Similarly, if I type UCI and I've issued the query Judy Olson before that, um, or Gloria, or, uh, or versus road cycling, versus storage containers. It gives you some indicate. No, these are very different contexts, right? And presumably you want different results in those cases. Okay, here's one. Um, I issued the query ego, and before that, id. So what do I want to learn about? Right, psychology. psychology, right. How about El Dorado Gold Corporation? Okay, that one's pretty self-evident. Dangerously in love. Okay, what do I, ooh. Somebody know this? Huh? Both ego and dangerously in love are Beyonce songs. Judy, where have you been? Let's get with this century. So there is a group of people who know what this means. Uh, this actually gets... Somebody at lunch was asking, like, how do you get the judgments? And this is why you can't have people like us judge information. Like, I have no idea what this means. I'm like, you know, who knows? I did, you, you learn a lot by working with web search logs uh, about popular culture. And so our personalization model combined both the short-term context as well as the longer-term interest. And for this, we started again with a large-scale log analysis. We looked at three extents. So one was, um, this is the current query. We looked at everything you've done in this session. We also looked at everything you did before the current session. And then we looked at the union of those. Um, and it, things were down-weighted temporally. So things that you had done longer ago were not as weighted as heavily as things you had done uh, more recently. So which sources are important? It turns out that if you use just session information, you can gain about 25% compared to not doing anything. If you use just historic data before the previous session, you can gain about, what is that, 45%. And if you use various aggregates of both short and long term, you gain uh, you know, between 65 and 75% accuracy. So uh, a lot of the models use, use both of these. It's interesting to think about what happens within a session. So the first query in a session, you, you can't use, all you can use is historical information. And so all of these bars are the same. Once you have one query, you can start seeing that this green bar, which is what happens in a session, starts increasing. And by the third query, the session information is dominating the long-term information. And so starting here, the session information becomes more important, and it only increases as you go further and further through the session. Um, so again, here we're combining uh, different types of information, and they're useful at different points in the session. So early on, I have to go on historical stuff. As you get further and further down, if, you're, if you've been in a search session looking 
um, what was I looking for recently? It was some repair for my stove. I, I must have spent an hour and a half looking for this stuff. You know, by the 30th query, you should have known what I, I meant by these queries, and you should have fixed the problem. Um, okay, the, the last item, the, so these are the, the kinds of major efforts we've done looking at how you can person, how you can understand, better interpret a, qu a short query that somebody is providing using a variety of, um, of sources. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about some more recent work we've done um, <coughs> that in the previous work I only considered judgments, either implicit or explicit, that were from the individual who issued the query. Here, I want to just again briefly mention some of the work that we're using to see whether you can get other people to make judgments like those that you would make. And so um, we looked at two different methods. One of them is called grokking. So the idea is if I give you some information about my interests, can you grok, can you understand what I might like in the future? The other one is match, taste matching. You want to find people who are like me. This is very much like collaborative filtering. Um, and these are, this kind of technique might be really useful for cases where I have personal collections, where the collection is really dynamic, or the collection has just many unique items. And I, I might be quite willing to tell some, if I'm an art collector, say, hey, I like these three paintings, these not so much. Can you be on the lookout for these for me? There are huge privacy issues if you start getting in personally relevant content. But I think that the same technique can be used for a whole host of um, much less private um, kinds of, of information. And we see, studied a few different tasks. Okay, so the idea in these personalized judgments is a requester says, I like this, no, I don't like the salt shakers on the left, the one in the middle with the little Hawaiian uh, people in Lua, in, in Lula skirts or whatever, uh, is really good, and this one is not so good. So I've told you everything about this person that I know. What's their rating on that one? One? How about one or four? One. Four. 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 Okay. You, you grok that person. You know, it's a pretty simple need, I, I must admit. Um, and it turns out it works well for simple needs, not so well for others. The other case is, um, here's a person who tells you their, uh, so this person has given these votes, and now I need to find a person who's like them who's seen this item. So in this case, you would match the first person as somebody who's similar to me and you could use their prediction on this item for me. This is essentially what collaborative filtering does. Okay. So what we did, um, th these two different situations are inter inter interestingly different from a number of perspectives. The grokking case, where I try to summarize what somebody's information, what somebody's preferences are, requires many fewer judges. It's actually quite fun for the people doing it. We got great, this is like a really fun task. They back channels where come to this task, it's really cool, you get to understand what people are doing. Um, but it is hard to capture complex preferences. But if you do this grokking, these, this is a ran the root mean square error for a random baseline. If you add this kind of, um, you have workers who have kind of grokked your interest, they have a much, much smaller error rate than, and uh, yeah, in the, the case of the salt shakers, not so much in the case of complex food preferences from two different cities. Um, when you do the matching, to people who are like you in collaborative filtering. This requires many workers. You have to have a lot of people in your pool to pick from. Um, it's really easy, and the judgments are reusable. So if a new person enter the, enters the system, imagine I build a profile for Gloria. Uh, and so we've got people who are on point for finding uh, Gloria really interesting new papers to read. Um, but then somebody else comes in. They now have to, to have people who understand their interests. So if I just look at people's kind of ad hoc uh, interaction and their ad hoc ratings, then the data is easily re reusable regardless of who comes in. These kinds of, of methods turn out to be good when the preference structure in the domain is, is much more complex than you can convey with uh, a few simple pictures or some simple descriptions. So I think crowdsourcing is potentially promising in domains um, where there is a lack of, of prior data uh, and established personalization methods don't work. But there are huge privacy issues and one needs to think hard about 
what you're willing to reveal about yourself or your interests. Um, people do it a lot. They do it with personal shoppers. They do it uh, in, a, you know, in a variety of, of situations. But I, there, there are challenges there. Um, I want to spend the next 10 minutes or so talking about some of the challenges in, in privacy, I mean in, in personalization. So there are two classes of challenges. One have to do, um, as I say, are more user-centered, and there are a couple that are more system-centered. Um, one of the interesting system ones that I'm not going to talk about is that when you do personalization, you kind of break everything we know about caching. Um, and pragmatically, the way that a lot of people overcome that is to cache more stuff and then do this, this re-ranking rather than completely new retrieval. Uh, but you know, it does require more storage, it does require a different runtime, and it, it requires, uh, you know, every person in every context at every point in time wants different results, and you can't cache results. And that's absolutely critical for many of these kinds of navigational queries. Um, so let me talk a little bit about privacy. Um, fundamentally, the model you have of a person and the data you're trying to personalize need to live in the same place. So if you have a local profile like we had in P-Search, it's really private. We only send the query to the server. We don't alter it in any way. We don't reveal anything about your interests. But then all the computation has to happen on the local device. Um, it's inefficient because you have to bring back many more results so that I can find some way of reorganizing them. And there's no way to take advantage of other people who might be like me. Or th you know, when things happen in the world, I might be interested in things that I'm not usually interested in. And so there's no way to leverage uh, that broader community in, in providing good services. Uh, in the cloud mitigates a lot of the device specificity, the inefficiency, the ability to learn from others. Um, but I think as, as service providers, uh, we worry tremendously about privacy. And I think the most important thing we can do is to be transparent about what's, what's stored and then give people control over it. Uh, but it is really important to do. Uh, and then there are a bunch of other approaches that are becoming more and more practical. So people have lots of public or semi-public profiles, you know, your Twitter profile, public Facebook feeds, uh, IMDB, thing, anything you review. There are also lightweight profiles, just things that have happened in the current session, you can throw it away after. Um, and then you can always match to a group of people who are like me along any number of dimensions. It could be where we are, what conference we're at. So you can mitigate some of the risks uh, of, of individual um, leakage of, of information by matching to groups rather than individuals. One of the co most common questions I get is, does personalization mean the end to serendipity? Um, and the answer is absolutely not. We did a study, it actually can improve it, and I'll tell you how. We did a study in which we had a personalized ranking algorithm, and we asked people to judge the relevance of results to each of the, the queries. Not surprisingly, personalization led to better results. But some, but quite surprisingly, it also led to more interesting results, even if they weren't relevant. And I think the reason for that is when you think about serendipity, you think about randomly picking, picking things, you don't want to inquire, you know, run into random information. You want information that's maybe at the fringes of what you care about that you might not have otherwise looked at. Uh, in education, people have something called like the, what is it, the zone of learnability, where you want information that's just beyond what you know now. You don't want to do, uh, you know, PhD level organic chemistry if you've just started understanding chemical compounds. Right? You want to push yourself, but not far. And I think the same is true here. You want stuff that you can ground or you can scaffold from. Uh, and if you, how many folks know about the, what's his name, Horace Walpole's? story on the princes of Serendip, who uncovered uh, a mystery of camel tracks in the, the sand based on a variety of accidents, but also sagacity. They, it was not that they were taking in random facts, or taking in facts that they could put together and make sense of. And I think the same thing happens in, um, in serendipity. It needs to be grounded and related to something. Uh, Evaluation is the, the last thing uh, that, I'll, that I'll talk about. So the way that uh, most information retrieval systems had been judged, I'd say, until 15 years ago or so, is you'd have a, um, a benchmark set, a set of ground truth queries and documents. So you might have 100 <coughs> queries. For each of those queries, we have a pool of documents and an assessor uh, in, I'll talk about the assessors in, in a minute, um, 
would judge the relevance of every document to every query. Right? It's pretty clear. These assessors and TREC, or NIST, has done a number of these large-scale evaluations. They're absolutely critical in helping people in, improve their search engines. The assessors were former uh, def retired Defense Department analysts, so they were very uh, methodical in, in looking at, at information. But what they weren't was realistic users. They didn't have the diversity of context, just in the same way that nobody in this room knew what dangerously in love was or that ego was related to it. They do not know what's relevant to uh, you know, the, the broad variety of, of individuals. Um, crowdsourcing can help. So if you had a, a crowd do things in different locales with different backgrounds, that might help some. But I think fundamentally, the people who make the, the judges, the judgments are the actual searchers. We can do it in this kind of offline fashion where I, you ask people to judge what's relevant. Um, or you can do it implicitly through log behavior. So if you have a history of how people have interacted with particular uh, search results and you want to try a new algorithm, you can in a way that doesn't harm anybody, it wastes a few you know, computational cycles, you can look at whether your brilliant idea will actually move up things that people selected in the ranking. So you can do some of the offline evaluations. It really allows safe exploration um, of many different alternatives. And then for the ones that kind of bubble to the top, you try those with A-B experiments. You, that's the only way to really know what, uh, what works in practice. And as I mentioned before, you can use explicit judgments, which are nice. Um, they're the right answer. They're the ground truth in, in some ways. But they're annoying, and they may change. They may actually change behavior. If I'm forcing you to justify everything you click on, you may interact with systems differently. Um, implicit judgments, sort of what I, how long it takes me to do things, whether I click on a, whether I issue a query and don't click on anything, whether I issue a query and quickly go back to the search results, whether I issue a query and reformulate. All of those are implicit measures of how I'm interacting with systems. Those are abundant in, if you're running a web service, but they're also incredibly noisy. And so the real challenge in a lot of this work is linking this breadth uh, and horribly messy implicit signals you're given with what the ground truth would be. And I have a, another slide on that that I took out um, so that I get a chance to ask questions. Um, so what I've tried to do today is highlight some of the uh, both opportunities and challenges in developing systems that are sensitive to uh, context in which the queries are asked. Um, the first point I tried to make was that queries are incredibly difficult to interpret in isolation. Right? And augmenting a query with all sorts of contextual information can help. There is a huge potential for improving search via personalization and through a whole host of other methods. I mean, I'm not arguing that you shouldn't try to improve the core ranking algorithm. We still have a long way to go. Um, and I gave several examples. I think there are some challenges um, that we can mitigate to some extent, but uh, you know, we still have issues of, of <coughs> privacy, transparency, transparency, and um, and some and serendipity. You could perhaps develop techniques that would encourage serendipity, and then evaluation. And, the, and systems optimization are really huge when you have essentially a different system or a different uh, algorithm for everybody. But I think the, the thing that I'm uh, most excited about is that contextualization is really prevalent today. And I think it's only increasing, especially in mobile and proactive search scenarios. And I think it's up to us in, in this room, people who study computer science, people who study human-computer interaction, uh, people who study systems, to take the lead in shaping best practices, both at the algorithmic level and at the policy level. Um, I think we're <coughs> able to, to do that. So I hope we, you take that challenge. Thanks. Thank you, Sue. Uh, so some of you might have to leave at three for a class. If you have to leave, you're, you're welcome to. We have some time for questions. Thank you. Um, you talked about a couple applications like navigation and sites for search, but you didn't talk about ad serving. It's not very it, related uh, and may also be economically driving some of the investment in personalization. Uh, it certainly is. I don't. I've, I've never worked in that area, um, but, it, but it, um, there are lots of things where you 
I guess I'm interested in, in people's information seeking and information um, uh, information needs. I, personal, uh, personalization is also relevant in, in ads. Um, one of the, we did do a study um, at some point that suggested that the quality of ads is actually really important, not just to um, ad revenue, but also to people coming back to search. So I think it's, um, if you give people good experiences, and part of that might be showing relevant ads or not showing any, in, in ads, one of the interesting things, maybe more interesting than, or at least as interesting in personalization, is whether you try to optimize sort of short-term revenue or longer-term um, behavior of, of individuals. And I can certainly optimize short-term revenue and then lose every single searcher. So there are a whole host of, you know, people want to provide good experiences and also um, make some reasonable money to support those, those free services. I, I don't work in ads at all, and so I, the cha many of the challenges I think are the same, uh, but there may be some unique things. In yeah, it seems that a lot of technology may also be very similar too. Yes, yes, yes. Those organizations typically live in the same area, and, although they don't all share the same code base. Uh, very interesting presentation, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> my question is, uh, since search is an, uh, an activity done by people, uh, and thus could be a skill, uh -huh. uh, should there be help for search? By which I mean, uh, yes. you know, if I, we've seen people type in search engines, you know, like expressions like Facebook.com, uh -huh. where they're trying to navigate to right. the site. <clears throat> um, or we've also seen people who can type in very long uh, strings of words because there's a very small number of things that might have uh -huh. uh, high relevance. So uh, should search be something that we should teach people how to do or rather just let it be a service that for uh, whatever? Uh, I, no, I, th I think that's um, uh, a, a great question. So for the, the, the thing, so URL fragments is, are, if you look at, at search logs, are really common. And so one of the things that search engines do now, although they didn't early on, is if you type something that is clearly a URL fragment, they will just take you to that page. Uh, in fact, the distinction in some browsers between the search <coughs> box and the address bar is disappearing. So that's a case where I think algorithmically we can do things. Um, spelling correction is another. Uh, things like Abercrombie and Fitch and Arnold Schwarzenegger are misspelled <laughs> more than they are spelled correctly. And we just better deal with that, right? You don't want people, like how many of you use autocomplete because you don't know how to spell anything? The, the, or you don't know how to spell complex words. I'm sure you know how to spell uh, many of the, the common function words. Uh, so that's a case where you can clearly, it's hard for people to articulate, it's hard for to get that right. Why do people need to know whether it's an address bar or a browser? You're trying to get at something and this browser should be able to help you. Um, there are a lot of skills that, you know, if you look at, at individual differences in search behavior, there are two classes of difference, differences. One is individuals. There are some people who are just amazingly skilled at it. Some of it is verbal fluency, but a lot of it is knowing tricks. So if I said to you, I want you to find my uh, LSI paper, where, what would you do? How would you search for that? Probably go to, uh, I, I won't say where, but you'd probably go to uh, a vertical site and search for it there. Um, that's a skill that you've, uh, it, it, you know about the sources. Uh, that also, I think, can be taught. If you want to hear about that, Dan Russell gives an absolutely marvelous um, lecture on that. He talks about some general strategies, knowing what's there, how you deal with, uh, and he, what is, it, uh, is it a Google a day? Oh. Uh, no, no, I, I, I told the people at lunch that I would not. Uh, no, I did not mention that word in the talk. Uh, he, he did come and give a talk here. Okay, so I mean, he talks it, but I think you know it, you can do both, right? There are things that I, as a searcher, don't need to, to know, uh, it, and the the what I search for co-evolves with the technology. So, ten years ago, if you said, um, you know, where does Gloria Mark work? Where where does Gloria Mark teach? The search engine would have. Who knows what they would have done? But it certainly, it would not have, and then if you said, and what his, you know, and, and what his, is her email address, that would have been even more disastrous. Now systems do recognize questions. They do recognize um, a little bit of a conversation, especially with pronominal reference. And so I think people, you're starting to see that emerge. Um, so I think we should help people articulate what they want, but also help them become more skilled in knowing about resources. 
some of that may um, have to be taught. I mean, it's a real literacy. People need to be good at it. Yeah. I want to build on that question in some ways. I'm, I'm just thinking about, yeah. Um, if I'm going to switch from keywords to spoken phrases, yeah. is all of the infrastructure that you built kind of gone all of a sudden, or can you still leverage that? No, there's, um, you know, for, for a while, search engines and any other kind of, um, almost any other kind of in interaction with, with people has been going from isolated keywords to entities. So you pull out, that's a simple kind of parsing. Uh, parsing a full sentence is you know, a little harder, but it's really not um, rocket science compared to being able to pull out individual entities. Maintaining a conversation that keeps the right amount of state going on uh, right now is pretty fragile. But once you've done that, you're then passing on different tokens to a back end. Um, so I, I, there are parts of this. Systems have evolved in lots of ways. Um, and I think there are a lot of things where speaking and query, it, speaking and query is great if you're, you know, if you're mobile. It's not so great if you're sitting in a classroom and you start talking to your phone or to your computer. Uh, so, and I think hearing results back orally is maybe more of a challenge than interpreting spoken queries. I think there, people are walking around with phones in front of them. And so we probably need to, to look at, uh, at both of those two. It, uh, it doesn't break things horribly. Uh, Thanks very much for this talk. Uh, really interesting. Um, my uh, nieces came and visited me a couple of months ago, and they wanted to, to watch some movies. So we pulled up Netflix and they searched for it. Uh, and my recommendations have been screwed up ever since. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so part what I what I want to um, ask is about so when, when we start to add context in. We have the, the issue of context collapse. Yep, yep. Um, and so, in part, what I would love to see in a search engine is not just that it know that, that I can control what kind of data it has on me. Yeah. Uh, I want to be able to start parsing that. Yep. And I want to be able to tell the, the search engine when certain things, because I, I know that my context better than the search engine yep. does. Yep. And I don't want it all to end up in the algorithm. That's right. Um, and. I had some slides that I dropped on atypical information needs, and what happened. And you know, the most atypical information needs are not. Uh, actually, my Amazon profile is is pretty confused because I shop a lot for my grandchildren and, and for me, and it's really, uh, and it's not the average of those, right? It's uh, it's maybe two or three different personas. I think we're close to the two or three different personas. Um, the, in, in web search, the case where that happens the most is when people search for things that are not their usual interests and, and activities. That, and they mostly appear in the domain of medicine and in the technical domain, people trying to figure out what the heck is wrong with their computer or their, their car. We have a, a system that is a two-face system that first tries to detect whether the current set of queries is, re is related to you, and that could be uh, kind of a big monolithic model of you, or it could be separate uh, personas. And then if it, if it is, it will use that information. If it's not, it'll, it'll ignore it. And if, it would be interesting to see if people would curate more. Um, people have built research systems where you can say, this is me in this context. Um, <clears throat> you and I, I I'm really compulsive. I, I must have you know, 3,000 folders. And, and so it might be useful if people could explicitly curate those and say, I'm putting on this hat right now. And yeah, that, that isn't, um, it's hard to know how well that would be used in general, but certainly the notion of being able to say, hey, this is atypical, let's, uh, let's drop the, the baggage is, is really useful. Okay. Maybe one last question. Thanks. Very loud. Yeah, sure. Thanks a bunch. Um, you had almost a throwaway comment when you were talking about how you were trying to fix your stove, and by the 30th play, I really should have gotten the idea. <laughs> sure everyone's had a similar yeah. experience. Um, is microphones are kind of scary? <laughs> is there anything in the algorithm that will say, "Look, this person has used a few different words to try to search over and over 30 times. Should I just switch up what I'm giving them?" Uh, yeah. The so search sessions are long for two very distinct reasons, and about the same number are long for each. 
One is total inability to articulate what you want. Uh, I'm sure there's a way to say what was wrong. I just didn't know what the little doohicker part, I just I had no idea. Uh, and I didn't want to mess with the guest. But th there are things where you just cannot say something in a way that matches essentially how people write about it. The other is that actually you're doing a lot of exploration. So I'm writing a new research paper. I might go off in several different directions. And in that case, I'm being productive. So what we've tried to do is, is distinguish between those two different kinds of um, long, reasons for long search sessions. And in the case where people look like they're struggling, and really what you see there is, um, is stuff that is pretty easy to detect. So after the 20th time you, say, you try something, you say, will you please get me? That, that's a pretty good signal that people, uh, if people are speaking the query, no, people will type that. Uh, if, you, if you hear people's voices when they're asking, you can detect that kind of frustration. So those, I, I think we can separate those. The challenge is, what do, you, what do I do about it? Like, how do you accommodate to that? So I've now discovered that you're pretty confused. You could say, hey, we have a search expert here. Uh, that's try to talk to a person. That would actually be a really interesting uh, kind of hybrid intelligence platform where you could say, look, I'll do it if I can algorithmically, and if not, I'll bring in a person. Maybe they can talk you through it or understand. That would be a, a fun service. I don't, uh, that, what, it would, you go back. You get my bank run already. Um, <laughs> you need to quickly move from human in the loop to algorithm and then let humans answer the other part of the problem. But the alternative is to do horrible things and not learn quickly. So uh, we can distinguish between those two situations. What I don't know yet is how to, at, uh, in a cost-effective way, uh, s satisfy those information needs. Thanks. All right, I'd like to thank Sue again.